Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Meet America. And we're going to be talking today about the devil's diet. What is the devil's diet? The devil's diet is the meat-eating diet. And why is it the devil's diet? Because the meat-eating diet is destroying our environment, our health, and, and we have got to get educated and realize what is going on. So that's my job. I'm Annie Griffin, your host, and this is Meet America. And we're going to start with the wild horses. Our wild horses are a symbol of America, of the Old West. They're very sacred to the American people. And by law, they're supposed to be protected. But in this corrupt government, nothing is sacred, and no laws are being upheld. So the law, which is the Wild Free Roaming Horse and Burl Act, which states that wild horses shall have devoted principal presence on their herd management areas. They were given originally in 1971 51 million of our acres of public land to reside on. That was the law because the American people wanted it that way. It was the second most how do you say, uh, people wrote in more about this than they did any other cause other than the Vietnam War at that time. And that's why it passed. And uh, since then, the cattle industry has taken over and it's having the laws circumvented. The judges, in my opinion, are all equally corrupt, told that they better just uh, rule with uh, the Bureau of Land Management, which is basically just a cattle-run organization by the government. And as a result, thousands and thousands, 46,000 of our horses have been removed in the last four and five years. And our Secretary of Interior, Sally Jewell, who is a uh, basically an oil and gas uh, person, uh, is uh, doing nothing about it. And we're spending millions of dollars a year of tax dollars that should be going into inspecting meat our conventional meat supply because of all the recalls is instead going up to round up these wild horses and of course the cattle industry is having everything else rounded up too the bison the deer the coyotes the wolves the bear anything that competes with the livestock industry has to be removed and all because of your meat diet so if you can, just say no. Even one day a week, that's going to have a huge impact. So let's watch what's going on with our wild horses. And uh, then I'll show you some other things, the health aspects of eating meat. Thank you for watching. You're seeing the wild horses at Sheldon being removed illegally by this government. Uh, they put him in holding areas with terrible circumstances, no shade, uh, 
it, Palomino Valley last year, they didn't even have water in 117 degree heat. They hide a lot of them, they say, on ranches where they're not accessible and they've been caught, uh, uh, the BLM has been caught uh, selling them for slaughter, even though it's illegal to do so. Uh, unless they have been out for adoption three times and haven't been able to be adopted. And you can't get the proper records. So all this is, you know, million, costing you millions of dollars that should be going into inspecting meat. 600 meat inspectors are going to be laid off this year. And uh, that means that your meat will not be safe. So you're part of the corruption by not doing anything about this. The horses are our spiritual messengers. They are warning you that if this government can get away with doing this so blatantly, with so many people, thousands of people call about this issue and have been calling and it's totally ignored and the cruelty that goes along with it as you can see this horse is wounded yet it still runs and they've hired a, a, a helicopter man who's been caught um, and thrown in jail, the couture, he's, uh, he did some illegal actions and the government is not supposed to hire anyone with any kind of a background at all, illegal background, and yet they've hired him. And he gets something like $360 for every horse he rounds up with that helicopter of your tax dollars. I, if you're not angry about this, and if you can just sit and watch and let it happen and go and eat your burgers, um, we're in deep, deep trouble because there's not going to be anyone out there to help you spiritually. If we don't help each other, if we don't stop this kind of corruption to the land, to the animals, then we're not going to be able to stop it when they come for you and I. And that's what's happening. So I hope you're going to help all you animal lovers out there to save our wild horses. Because they're symbol symbolic of America. this spring 
The agency protects and manages herds of wild horses that still roam the American West, rounding up thousands of them each year to keep populations stable. Well, right there you see that is incorrect reporting because what the BLM is doing is of the 55 million acres that was designated originally to horses under the Wild Free Roaming Horse and Burl Act, BLM has illegally phased out all the herd management areas but 22 million acres or thereabouts. And as they shrink their herd management areas and zero them out so that the cattle can have those areas, they say that the horses are overpopulated. And so they remove them and they say that they're taking them to long-term holding areas. But in actual fact, they're selling them by the truckloads to a well-known horse advocate slaughter person, Tom Davis, who um, advocates for horse slaughter and has been known to take horses to slaughter. And the BLM in this article uh, states that they did see absolutely no reason. Uh, they, they, right here, they say, we don't feel compelled to sell to anyone we don't feel good about. Uh, agency spokeswoman Tom Gorey said, we want the horses to be protected. Sally Spencer, who runs the Wild Horse Sales Program, said the agency has had no indications of problem with Davis and it would be unfair for BLM to look more closely at him based on the volume of his purchases. It's no good to just stir up rumors. We have never heard of him not being able to find homes. So people are innocent until proven guilty in the United States, which is not true. So the BLM has sold Davis at least 1,700 wild horses in Burl since 2009. Agency records show 70% of the animals purchased through its sale program. Like all buyers, Davis signs contracts promising that animals bought from the program will not be slaughtered and insists he finds them good homes. But Davis is a longtime advocate of horse slaughter. By his own account, he has ducked Colorado law to move horse animals across state lines and will not say where they end up. He continues to buy wild horses for slaughter from Indian reservations, which are not protected by the same laws. And since 2010, he has been seeking investors for the slaughterhouse of his own. Hell, some of the finest meat you will ever eat is a fat yearling colt, he said. What is wrong with taking all those BLM horses? They all got fat and shiny and setting up a kill plant. Animal welfare advocates fear that horses bought by Davis are being sent to the kill floor. So what I'm asking you to do, public, is I want you to call your congressperson and I want you to ask them for a congressional investigation into the BLM selling these horses to Tom Davis. We want answers. And BLM can say, well, you know, we're just selling him the excess horses that are 10 years or older that no one can adopt, no one wants to adopt. Well, there are people who want to buy 10 of these horses at a time, and BLM won't allow them any more than 10. Yet they're selling Tom Davis at $10 a head when it costs us taxpayers $1,000 a head to gather up these horses. That's what it costs. And they're selling it to Tom Davis at $10 a head by the truckload. And that's okay, but people who want to save the bloodline of these horses can't buy any more than 10 at a time. So you can see the criminal intent of what the BLM is up to. Ken Salazar, Secretary of Interior, a, absolute shame, a, 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 a stain of shame upon our country this man is. He needs to be in jail. And instead, he's running our parks and our BLM program and everything. And Tom Davis lives right next to Ken Salazar. They're both have, you know, our next door neighbors. And so this is what's going on, folks. And I hope that you will have the 
the compassion in your heart to do something because if you allow them to take such a sacred animal and slaughter it after what it's done for us in this nation shame on you and God will have no mercy on us for being so callous in our disregard it, it, it's really a, a terrible blight upon our nation what is happening and again the horses are the are the messengers of this So what I'm about to show you now is uh, a video of a Canadian meat processing uh, factory. They're processing halal meats for uh, Islamic uh, people. They're only allowed to eat uh, halal uh, meat. I'm not sure if that applies to other vegetables and stuff, but I know it applies to meat. They have to butcher animals in a particular way. Either way. Um, so what's going to happen is this uh, factory worker is going to find evidence of uh, E. coli, I believe it was, and present it to the manager of the, the uh, factory, who just ignores him and fires him. CBC News has learned that one of British Columbia's largest meat packers covered up a food safety scare. The company discovered a potentially dangerous and deadly strain of E. coli in some of its meat. No illness was reported, but it took months before any of it was recalled. Kurt Petrovich now with this exclusive investigation. He says he wants to come in from the cold to shed light on why one of BC's biggest beef and lamb slaughterhouses was shut down last fall. Daniel Land was in charge of quality assurance, regularly providing samples to a lab for testing before meat was shipped to halal grocers and restaurants around the province. Last September, Land showed the plant's manager a test indicating E. coli 0157. He said this does not leave this room and I don't want nothing to do with, I don't want nobody talking about this. He crumpled it up and threw it into my, my garbage can. Land says he then went to the federal inspector at the plant. She cried because she says they're covering it up. I says yes, and she said same old story. Still nothing happened, and Land says he was fired after complaining about the cover-up and other problems at the plant. Eventually, Land called the Canada Food Inspection Agency himself. Ten days later, the agency issued a recall for meat that left the plant two months earlier. We had a test. We didn't handle it properly, um, and you know we're we're apologizing for that. But the plant manager hid the test, he says, because he thought Land may have tampered with it to sabotage the plant. I um, went along with the decision at that time to not go to CFIA, um, but uh, we should have gone to CFIA. Milka says some at the plant have been disciplined, some were let go, but the plant manager who buried the lab test has not been fired. The plant says subsequent tests revealed not a trace of E. coli. 600 samples examined by inspectors also came back negative. Land denies he tampered with the test. The CFIA says Land's allegations are being investigated. I wish I could say I was totally shocked, but I'm not. This federal inspector says what Land saw happens more than people realize. But the plant's excuse rings hollow. They have uh, covered the tracks so well that it's impossible now to determine the damage. And, you know, if, uh, from a cynical perspective, you could say that was their intent. The CFIA allowed the plant to reopen last month, but the owners gave up their federal license to process meat and got one from the province instead. They say it's a business decision that will save them money. Under provincial meat regulations, the job Daniel Land did, looking over people's shoulders, isn't required. Kurt Petrovich, CBC News, Red Deer. I really uh, can't believe that this happens so often, although I can. I mean, we have a capitalist for-profit system. The only care is for money. Um, when the only variable is how much profit that you can make that enters into your equations, compassion and taking care of uh, your community and helping your family, it just doesn't become a part of the equation. So uh, 
I think it's just ridiculous, you know, that he went to his boss and they fired him. They didn't even look at it. They just fired him. And uh, then the guy had to go and call the Canadian, you know, food board to have something done about it. It's just really ridiculous. You know, we, we shouldn't be relying on these for-profit uh, jerkwads, you know, for... Uh, for what we imbibe into our system, what we're, you know, ultimately uh, dependent on to survive. We should be having our own system, our own system of permaculture gardens, you know, everywhere throughout the world. Why can't we have just tons and tons of permaculture gardens that just grow food for free or at a very small gov government subsidized rate where you could have people working on it under, um, you know, strict regulative conditions, which are not subject to any kind of, you know, uh, privateership from some corrupt entrepreneur who's trying to, you know, sell you fucking meat with E. coli in it and doesn't want to freaking uh, tell the, the food inspecting board because it would risk their company. It's ridiculous. This food needs to be uh, government subsidized or people subsidized, one or the other, but it needs to be in the hands of the people and not in the hands of private banksters. And I think that we're going to see this in the near future. Um, I was just talking to one of my friends who was interested in helping me with this Earthship project, and he was saying... ...don't we? We get poisoned, we, be, we get killed, we blame the government, but it doesn't bring back the children who, who die from this. And uh, you don't see half of it. You don't see the mothers suffering every day from the children they've lost. Uh, they don't show you the thousands of people that were sickened. You might get a story from one or two. And so Pythagoras' prediction has come true, that we have become brute-like beings. Uh, we eat suffering animals, and now the government has become a lawless entity. It doesn't listen to us anymore. It breaks all its own laws, but we, uh, you know, we're helpless to do anything about it. Our constitution is broken, our rights are broken, the judges rule in favor of the government, so we have nowhere to turn anymore, and we've become slaves to the masters. And now they have uh, concentration camps that they call re-education camps, and we're going to listen to a bit of J Alex Jones, who's uh, done extensive research into that. And just to prove my point, that when we become beings that are brutal, and we don't care about what's happening to the animals, um, then we lose compassion for ourselves. And we become warlike and greedy and brutal and uh, clouded in our thinking. And all we are is hungry, hungry, hungry for more blood, for more meat. And that's what happens to us. So it's so important to understand where your meat habit is taking you and taking the planet and the future you're creating for your children. It's Thursday, May 3rd, 2012. I'm Alex Jones, and this is InfoWars Nightly News. Tonight, the battle lines have been drawn. Breaking news from InfoWars.com as leaked U.S. Army documents outline the plan for re-education camps in America. Shocking plans discovered to put political activists in prison camps and then to be pacified by PSYOP officers. It's decision time for the U.S. military. Whom will you serve? Then, the FBI's latest plot to engineer their own job security as five crackheads in Cleveland are arrested after being recruited and trained to blow up bridges. 
Plus, shocking video of police drugging Occupy protesters, corrupt officers, and county deputies caught in the act. Alex Jones talks to Dan Fight, the producer of the video that documents Minnesota police picking up young people off the street for training programs. Multiple participants say officers gave them illicit drugs and gave them incentives to take the drugs and encouraged them to be informants. InfoWars nightly news investigates plus an update on ron paul's campaign surge as he moves into position to seize control of the gop all that and more on the infowars nightly news and now your host alex jones Tonight's top story confirms everything that we've been documenting for years. It's been leaked, and since then we've confirmed it's even on an official Army.gov website. U.S. Army document outlines plan for re-education camps in America. Political activists would be pacified to sympathize with the government or learn their Stockholm syndrome, because the government itself is run by foreign banks. It goes on to say they would identify malcontents, trained agitators, or people that don't like being gang raped by the government, and political leaders within the facility who may try to organize resistance or create disturbances in the United States. They develop and execute indoctrination programs to reduce or remove antagonistic attitudes. Don't like the fact your kids were shipped over to Saudi Arabia? While you're in a FEMA camp, they'll teach you. And identifies political activists. Don't have that in America. Hell, ask George Washington. That's illegal. Provides loudspeaker support. I've been to urban warfare drills where they train to target the American people. Such as administrative announcements. America is a pig house that worships your loving bankers. Right out of Red Dawn. When necessary, helps the military police commander control detainee and the evil American populations. Plans and executes a PSYOP, or psychological warfare, that's what our military is for, to wage war against us, that produces an understanding and appreciation of U.S. policies and actions. It goes on. This story has gone mega viral, as it should. FEMA camps confirmed in triplicate and at their re-education camps. What's wrong with those? They have them in North Korea. Got a little news flash for the globalist. You may have drugged and dumbed down and brainwashed most of the American people, but a large cohort of us are awake. And if you think you're going to take this country like it's Soviet Russia or Nazi Germany or Chicom China, you've got another thing coming. There's enough of us left who understand what's happening that you're not going to get away with this. And by the way, this stuff's blowing up in your face. You think we're scared by all this? You may have even leaked us on purpose. It doesn't scare us. It only lets us understand we're on the right side of history. Continuing with the... Shifting gears, since we broke that news last week of the declassified Army document for re-education camps for political dissidents inside America, we've had a chance to really go over the 327-page document with a fine-tooth comb. And it's got slave labor in it for U.S. citizens and processing us with our Social Security numbers into the slave camp. This is just, oh, well, par for the course now. You know, the CIA director says they're operating domestically, which is illegal, and they're spying on the American people through their iPhones and other devices without warrants. But that's okay. Now we're going to be taken to the re-education camp. So yesterday it's the TSA groping your children and your wife, uh, and now... The system is coming uh, after us physically to throw us in the re-education camps. But first, they'll collapse society. They admit part of it will be economic uh, inside the re-education camp. Uh, you know, people will be there as refugees. They'll also be the political area where you're actually locked up as prisoners. I think that's pretty darn important. Speaking of re-education camps, the military itself is under incredible brainwashing and manipulation and is finally starting to wake up. Uh, per capita more than any other group. We have another report here out of WorldNet Daily reporting on a purchase bid put out 
uh, by DARPA, where DARPA is saying they'll give people incredible, um, you know, investment of hundreds of millions of dollars, basically, if people can bring them proposals for super high-tech chips to be implanted into the troops. And I've actually talked to military, including people in my family. Uh, the military is already getting chips in the officer class and others, and that is classified. Uh, so very, very serious news on that front. We certainly are in a 21st century technocracy that's being established. And here's another report from the Daily Mail that integrates into the microchip uh, report. All over the U.S. and British news, they tell you every day, hey, you are being watched, you know. Better watch what you have to say. And uh, here's the headline, watch what you type. Surveillance cameras so strong they can zoom in and read text messages. Well, the government's already reading people's text messages uh, illegally, and it's amazing. Another powerful article out of WorldNet Daily today, and we actually did a report on this last year. Um, they allow people to have Facebooks calling for killing George Zimmerman. And they have Facebooks showing the most wild stuff you can imagine. But our supporters, Infowars.com supporters and others, well, we've had our Facebooks deleted before. We've got a bunch of accounts that fans have set up and turned over to us over the years with millions of likes. Our main is the Alexander Emmerich Jones uh, channel. And by the way, it has the wrong spelling of Alexander Emmerich Jones because the fan used the Wikipedia spelling of my middle name. It's incorrect. People always ask, which is it? Well, whatever. Uh, the point is you can like us over there if you want to help get that out while we're still on Facebook. But a pedo book, which is basically what Facebook is, they allow people to call for killing George Zimmerman. So does Twitter. Um, but if uh, you want to talk about liberty or patriotism, you get uh, shut down. Well, now... Facebook shows kids rape, sodomized, and uh, that's the headline. And there's a warning that the report contains graphic details of sexual abuse of children. And it, it appeared in numerous locations on Facebook. World Net Daily immediately reported images of child pornography and child sexual abuse. The FBI censored screenshots published are among the mildest of those found. And it is unbelievable. Unbelievable what is on there, and having three young children, it makes me feel extremely violent. And by the way, HBO's rolled out a new comedy series where it shows five year old girls performing fellatio on giant sex toys. But CPS on a fake tip by a neighbor will come and take your children. And, of course, CPS is five times more likely, according to Justice Department's own numbers, to be abusers, including sexual abuse. In fact, that's even higher. Uh, and it's just unbelievably criminal what this government has become and what it does. And going to the FBI, there are some good people low level, but DynCorp Halliburton has come out, run giant child kidnapping rings, and don't get in trouble. So uh, World Net Daily did a good job reporting on this. Uh, but... Um, it just makes me sick. By the way, I, w I want to shift gears into another report uh, here. This is out of the Daily Mail. And I've told you about this for years. Uh, they sell whole babies, ground up babies, and pills. A lot of the top cosmetic ma makers uh, are, are, are getting melted down babies. Uh, you know, P PepsiCo has admitted that they use fetal tissue in their flavoring. Uh, and federal regulators have ruled that shareholders can't stop that or demand that that stops. Uh, so this is like the golden child or something where the devil's trying to get the golden child to you know, eat something unclean. I mean, this is really evil. Thousands of pills filled with powdered human baby flesh discovered by customs officials in South Korea. You know, if we buy slave goods from China, we then get deindustrialized. And if we have 52 million abortions in this country since Roe v. Wade, we then become garbage as well. When you treat human life like garbage, there is a quick slide to the bottom. And all of the blessings of liberty go out the window. We are a rotten, decadent society. And the corrupt are feeding off those of us that still produce and still work hard. But undoubtedly... This society is going to go through some very tumultuous times in a series of collapses before people finally get their morality back. But.
country industries for 44 years, both in terms of the federal government, working for the federal government, as well as uh, working for private industry. So we'll be probing that experience today. Uh, so 44 years. She retired in the year 2010, uh, and then something happened, um, which is that all of a sudden the Department of Agriculture last year decided to make a program national. And this is the hemp program, which we'll be delving in in some detail. Hemp is uh, an inspection system whereby the line speeds of poultry plants are increased substantially so that one bird will be going down the line uh, uh, every third of a second and there will be one inspector, maybe two at most, but one or two inspectors that will now be looking at these birds at this tremendous rate of speed. A second thing that's happening with the hemp program is the number of inspectors are decreased substantially. So there are fewer inspectors looking at birds that are flying by at an incredible rate of speed. In addition to that, much of the quality assurance process uh, is actually turned over to the companies themselves. So those are three, three aspects of the program, which I believe Phyllis will be talking uh, about, you know, about her problem with. And so she decided to come out of retirement and be the face of resistance to this new program. Uh, and so she worked with um, um, the uh, .org, what is it here? Change.org, sorry. Uh, she was so working with Change.org. Uh, she put together a program to reach out to the American public and 185,000 people so far, and I think the number is growing, uh, have signed her petition and she's presented that to the Department of Agriculture. Uh, so, uh, she will, so we'll be talking about what, what that process has been like. Uh, so with that, I'll sit down over there and be asking my questions. And pre as well, remember, as well, we'll have questions from the audience, so please hold those uh, as we go. So you worked at the poultry industry. Could you describe the kind of jobs that you had? Okay, I went to work as, I guess you'd say, a child. I was uh, barely 18 years old the first time I worked in a poultry plant. Everything back then was done virtually by hand. We had very few pieces of equipment in these plants. And you were taught sanitation, um, Back then, people were very, you know, good old southern cooks are very clean cooks, and we were trained and did our job as if we were cooking it or cutting it up to go to our children that day. Uh, you could eat off the floors. They were that clean. Uh, as years have gone by, uh, bird speed back then was only 44 birds a minute going down the line with uh, three inspect federal inspectors on that line. Uh, the federal inspector at that time looked at every bird, palletized the uh, visceral, checked for liver and spleen tumors, uh, a number of diseases you detect by looking at that visceral in the bird, okay? And looking down inside the bird, turning the bird completely around, looking for all bruises, feathers, anything that needed to be removed from that carcass. Okay, then time went on. They got more quick automation. They went up to 66 birds a minute. Still had the three inspectors online, but you had house inspectors in case something was missed by the, uh, in which I did that job for a long time. I was an inspector's helper also at one time. And then I progressed to the house inspector because you look for everything that this equipment left behind the lungs, the kidney, whatever needed to be done to the chicken before it goes into the uh, chiller. Then through the years, I progressed into quality assurance and did a lot of tests. Uh, back 
backed up USDA with their test if they failed when we went to 91 birds a minute. At 91 birds a minute, uh, you have three inspectors on the line getting approximately 30 and a third birds per minute to look at. Okay, there's a program called SIS that is 71 birds a minute, and those inspectors get a right at 35 birds per minute. Okay, so we're talking how many birds a federal inspector can look at per minute. No more than 35 birds per minute is presented to a federal inspector. Okay, then as automation came along, some plants are running what they call a mine maestro, which runs up to 105 to 140 birds a minute, depending upon their equipment. And they have like four inspectors because, like I said, nobody can look at no more than 35 birds a minute. And their chicken is tilted where they can see inside of it, see the whole chicken. The visceral comes along with the chicken in a cup. They're allowed to, they look at the visceral and the bird goes on down the line. Okay. Then the government, USDA, which was my employer, came up with this hemp program. Let's take all the federal inspectors off the line and put them on the floor at that time. And I was one of the first. There was a team of four GS-8s and a GS-9 with a veterinarian on each shift. And I was one of the team on the second shift, at, um, which is now Pilgrim's Pride in Gunnersville, Alabama. It was Gold Kissed at the time. Uh, the officials from the plant went to Canada to look at their situation to see how to position their people. They also, USDA, allowed their uh, what they call food safety supervisors to go out to Texas and go to the same poultry school that uh, the inspectors went to to see how to inspect and po poultry. Then they Normally, most of the ones that started out was uh, inspectors, helpers, got the what they call sorters jobs. They turned all the inspection, birds on, hands-on inspection, over to the company. And through time, very short time, these girls said, oh, how did y'all do that all these years? This is too hard. I'm bidding off of this. I'm going to bet a different job. Even though it pays more, I want off of this. Okay, so they just get anybody, put them up on the line. Sometimes they'll touch the bird. Sometimes it just goes by because they're talking, they're busy. But during this time, though, they decided, well, you're against the law. The law was written, carcass the carcass inspection in 1907, I believe it was. Uh, Congress and passed and that, the law. And that's still the law? Still the law today. Carcass the carcass inspection. So they come up with this grand little idea. We'll put the inspectors, one per line at the end of the line so that they can oversee each carcass before it goes into the children. We'll call that carcass inspection. No hands-on. At one point, we were allowed to look down in the birds. We'd raise our stands so we could look down in the bird as it flew by us. You'd see a lot of fecal material in that bird, a lot of IP, which is where a sore has got all crusted and yucky inside the skin, uh, pulse running out of it, all of that mist, you know, just gross stuff. Just, Anyone eating right now? <laughs> just gross. And they call this... Minor things, you know. USDA says, oh, that's just little minor blemishes. No, it's not. It's disease. Okay? So then they decided we were writing because we were behind their zero tolerance rinse cabinet. We were between it and the chiller. So they decided that we were writing too many non-compliance reports. And this is how USGA gets their wonderful little information through the computer of their non-compliance reports, okay? So we were writing too many. So they sent circuit supervisors out to make sure that we knew never to raise that stand again to look down in that bird. We were only allowed, and still today, only allowed to look straight ahead of you, looking between the two legs of the bird, which down in here is the kill, the breast kill, 
you are not supposed to look below that breast keel down into the cabin. You only see this bird coming to you, the two legs hanging like this, flying at 175 or above. Some people are running 180. You're seeing the side here that's coming to you with a wing. You might catch this side going out. A lot of times you catch a lot of fecal on the wings where the water's bloated into the little place of the wing there, on the tips of the wings, on the legs up the, where the visual is caught, got uh, on the legs. You find a lot of feces. Okay, so we were writing non-compliance reports on all the fecal material. Okay, bring an idea USDA came up with. We will put the final zero tolerance test behind the federal inspectors. Then they cannot write us a non-compliance report because it's before the final zero tolerance testing area and cabinet. So then, so you see, I'm I'm just giving you a little taste of. The absolute corruption that's going on. The government is run by industry. And industry is run by your pocketbook. So every time you go buy a chicken, you are actually giving money to that industry and saying it's okay to slaughter the animals however you want and I don't care of inspection and I don't care what goes into my, my body and I don't care what goes into my kids or my family's body. Just give me the damn meat. And you're getting your karma. You are getting your karma. Now I have been a vegetarian for 25 years. I haven't had meat in probably the, for about 20 years. And I am still here. I am 68 years old. I'm as healthy and unhealthy as any of the meat eaters out there. And <laughs> I'm living proof that you do not need to eat any meat or dairy. My bones are healthy. Uh, you know, what more proof do you need? You can go on YouTube, Clinton, the only thing that's saving his life is the fact that he's gone vegan. So it really is, in my opinion, the devil's diet. And every one of you that are eating meat, you know, now the government isn't inspecting the meat, your children are getting E. coli and dying, you're having all these horrible things happen to you, you have all these inspectors coming, whistleblowers coming out, she'll probably never be hired again. Luckily, she's at retirement age. But that's what I'm trying to bring forth to you, the absolute corruption and the fact that there's no respect. Because what is there to respect in human beings that allow this kind of torture to the animals and to themselves? It's, it's all karma. You could even say maybe God itself has deserted this planet and have forsaken it. For nothing has changed since Jesus Christ's time. Nothing. So, I hope that you really, really reconsider what you're doing. Because if you don't, you are going to pay karma-wise anyway. And um, it's going to be really bad for you. Really bad. So... Thanks for listening, and let's uh, continue on with her testimony. This is a whistleblower, in USDA inspector, telling you what's happening to uh, poultry and the inspection process there. Are we allowed to stop the line when we saw fecal or food safety, which is a sip-top bird? Or, uh, any bird that we would throw away if we were up doing hands-on inspection. If we found those issues, we had to stop the line, notify the company they were to take measures, slow down the line, what have you. If we did find a food safety issue, such as a uh, septic bird or a uh, leucosis bird, we would uh, have to write a non-compliance report on that, of course but not the fecal. 
So can, can I ask one question here? The, is this the hemp program? Is this, this is the hemp. And is this a pilot program? Okay. And this and is this a pilot program. program in 20 plants across the south, across the United States, okay. mostly in the southeast. Okay. Because we have so much poultry down there. And this plant. Um, hemp program is in a pilot stage and this pilot stage has been going on for over 10 years. That should tell everyone that if it's taken 10 years to run a pilot program to go nationwide with, it's not working. Right? Another point of view I want to bring out right now. If I'm going to give you 8 hours a day free labor, and you're, you own a company, and I'm giving you all these people eight hours a day free labor to watch after my product. So if it goes out the door and I'm not responsible, they're going to be responsible if this disease gets out. Why would you want to give up all that free labor, take on all those responsibilities? Common sense tells you they want to put everything on that market. Excuse me. Everything on that market that they can get out that back door. We call the front doors where the birds come in to be killed. The back doors going out shipping. Who who are the people that they put in the in, in your experience in the quality assurance position? In the sorter positions on the hemp line. Yes. On the in the sorter positions, they put these jobs up. It pays a couple of dollars more an hour than other jobs. Okay, they'll put them on their board for bids. And anyone that bids on them that they can halfway read or teach the diseases, what to look for, they slap them on the line. They so, so they don't have any They don't have training. any really formal training. The plant that I came out of does have a written program that they have to pass a little test on. But the other plants that I know of and associated with, they don't have this program. That is, whoever they can get to take those jobs, because it is a very hard job, because you're looking at, you're grabbing a bird like this. I mean, every second you've got a bird in your hand. It's impossible, impossible to see inside that bird and that bird as it's flying by at a third of a second. Or less. is Marianne Thieme and I'm a member of parliament for the party for the animals in the Netherlands and our party is the very first in the world to champion the rights of non-humans in a national parliament. However, there are other problems in the world aside from animal welfare. So tonight I'm going to tell you some very hard truths about what we are doing to our planet and I'm so pleased that you are ready to face up to these realities. years ever measured. They've all occurred in the last 14 years. The world is heating up fast and we have ourselves to blame. Global warming is real and we humans are almost certainly the cause. That's the world's greatest current concern. 
everyone finds themselves in his grip, from scientists to politicians to the Secretary General of the UN and even Leonardo DiCaprio. We face a convergence of crises. Industrial civilization has caused irreparable damage. By the middle of the century, there may be 150 million environmental refugees. Not only is it the 11th hour, it's 11.59. But it's that other film made by Nobel Prize winner Al Gore, which has truly succeeded in putting this global problem on the map. An inconvenient truth was a real wake-up call to the world. This was a great achievement for Al Gore. However, he forgot something rather important. The consequences of global warming are enormous. The climate researchers from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change have estimated that by the year 2100, one to three billion people will be in dire need of fresh water. Hunger will increase throughout large parts of the globe. So, it should come as no surprise that global warming is currently our foremost concern. Everyone who has seen Al Gore's film knows that our Earth is in bad shape. Greenhouse gas emissions must be reduced. This is on the agenda of every world leader. The causes of global warming must be dealt with now. And so, together we must identify the greatest emitters of greenhouse gases in our society. But do you think? What are the sources of greenhouse gases? The, the cars we're driving and the water waste and all the trash we don't care where, where we're throwing it. That's what I think. Cars, buses. It's industry, it's gasoline, it's energy use. All the fumes from car. Cars, too many vehicles maybe. Fumes in the air, all the gas and people driving in the city. Cars, factories, planes. I imagine the aviation industry hasn't helped. I mean, one airplane can fly across country and it's like 40 tons of, of carbon. 40 tons, that's a lot. I think in one word I would say pollution. Coal power stations, gas power stations. People using more energy than they need to. We are wasting a lot. An excessive use of, of gases. And also coal burning stations, especially in China. All the pollutants that we pump into the air day after day. Everyone says the same thing. It's the cars, the planes, the industrial plants. It's because we leave our lights on and take long showers. Always the same familiar answers. And, well, yes, of course it's true. But no one has yet won the grand prize. Because we're forgetting one extremely important factor. 18% of global greenhouse gas emissions are caused by livestock farming. That might surprise you. Farmed animals, 18%. And guess what percentage of total global emissions are caused by transport? 13%. Just think. All the cars, tractors, trucks, ships and planes in the world added together emit fewer greenhouse gases than livestock farming. Oh really? Wow, I thought it was mostly cars. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> livestock. That's crazy. So more than the cars. Are you serious? Yeah, I didn't know that. That's insane. No, I did not know that. No. Uh, that's news to me. I've never heard that. I'd never heard the livestock connection, no. Well, I knew there was some. I had no idea it was that extensive. Well, how does it come from livestock exactly? What do you call cow farts? <laughs> what do you call that? Okay. Yeah, the methane gas coming from the cows. Yeah. It's cow shit, right? It doesn't cow poop. It's the, what the emissions, right? I thought it was just fat people in the south here in America, but no, apparently it's cattle as well. It's quite worrying. <laughs> okay. Well, I saw an article that say uh, because the cow, what they fast, mm -hmm. and then actually the fasting makes the global warming. <laughs> yeah. But how, how can it be that farm animals place a heavier burden on the environment than the entire transport sector worldwide? Well,